Moi everyone, this is Life Abroad and on this channel I talk about fun places that I find therapeutic. I share with you school, job and business opportunities abroad and everything in between that I consider will help any person to navigate smoothly abroad. Well, if you are asking or if you are wondering, Moi is hi or hello in Finland and as you can imagine or guess I am having someone all the way from Finland who is going to share with us his experience as a student and um, his general life experience in Finland. This interview will help anybody who is planning to relocate to Finland go as a student or as um, a professional there to work or whatever your reason is this video or this interview is going to help you answer one or two questions before you go and clear any doubts before you go if this is something you are interested in stay tuned hi i hey. have here with me dr eugene enima he is a professional optometrist and he went to finland to study some postgraduate courses it's going to tell us all about it uh, hello to your viewers and your subscribers actually uh i'm eugene i'm from ghana mishri obwasi gold mine <laughs> yeah <laughs> the golden city um, i'm from obwasi and currently i'm in finland uh, i came to finland to study and do my postgraduate master's in public health I'm an optometrist by profession, as you've already said, and I was working in Ghana for like five years before moving here. I came to Finland in the year 2021. Uh, so my master's was for two years and I'm done with my master's currently. Roaming around in town and all that. Yeah, so that is a bit mm -hmm. of a... Okay, how would you describe Finland? Um, is it receptive to foreigners? Is it peaceful? Okay, so Finland is an interesting uh, country in its own nature by its nature that it has. It's a natural country with a lot of nature, like a lot of forests, a lot of lakes, a lot of snow, a lot of coldness. <laughs> yeah, so that is one aspect that makes Finland unique in one way or the other. Notwithstandingly, it is one of the happiest country in the world, basically. It has mm -hmm. been consecutively seven times the world's happiest country. Mm -hmm. uh, it being receptive to foreigners and international students in, in perspective is uh, unique because uh, it gives the students the opportunity to come to Finland, study, and have the opportunity of staying here after studies. Also, so it's an easy ticket for students to have, should I say, a permanent resident or a passport in the European uh, and a European country, specifically one of the most developed countries in Europe, that is Finland. Yeah. So I think, in my opinion, Finland is a very receptive country for most foreigners. That's good to know then. So, um, in the UK, if you want to study a postgraduate course, like a master's course to be precise, you are looking at coming to or coming to spend a year in the master's program. How was it like in Finland? Yeah, so Finland has a two-year master's degree program. It doesn't run one year as it's been done in the UK. So in Finland, it's always two years. So depending on where you would want to, whatever course that you're coming to do, if it's a master's program, then usually a two-year program. If it's a, a degree program, like a normal bachelor's degree program, then it usually ranges from around three, three years, six months to four years. That is approximately somewhere like four years. So I'll put it as four years. Just the same way we have a uh, bachelor's degree in four years. And mm -hmm. the other uh, less, uh, should I say, in the curriculum of educational system, that is the diploma. Diploma is usually for two years. So if you are coming to do any vocational course, it's usually a diploma level, then it's usually for two years. Yes. Yeah, so, but for a master's degree, it's usually two years. And of course, my, uh, PhD is usually four to 
say so here depending on how long you finish your code PhD program. Yeah. So, so I'm guessing that if anybody is coming to study um, a course, a master's degree program, then a person is going to have a two-year visa. Yes. Yeah, so one unique thing about Finland is that we don't use visas. Unlike other countries oh. where you need to come with a visa, in Finland, you don't come as, uh, with a visa. If you're coming to study like uh, an exchange student, like somebody from most, we usually sometimes have students coming from University of Lagos, the nursing department specifically, come to my university to do an exchange program. So exchange programs is actually open up to Ghanaian universities, like those from K University and University of East, uh, University of Ghana, Legon, they have opportunity to come to Finland to do Asian programs. You should actually try to explore those ones also. So if you're coming for an Asian program, usually it's just for one semester. So you don't need to, which is usually around three to four months. So you don't need to stay for that long. So that's one you need to apply for a visa, a Schengen visa. But without mm -hmm. that, if you're coming actually for a degree program, like you're coming for a diploma, you're coming for a master's, a bachelor's or a PhD, you don't come with a visa, you come with a resident permit. So unlike other countries where you need to come with visas, in Finland when you're coming, you come with a resident permit. So just as you come, you start accumulating uh, years to enable you to get your passport or get a permanent residency certification and all that. So it doesn't come with visas. You just come straight with a resident permit. And the resident permit is said that if I apply, if I get opportunity to get a master's degree to come and do in Finland, and if I'm married uh, and I have enough funds to show that, okay, when I come, I can take care of my family, the whole family also gets the resident permit. So it's not just you coming to get the resident permit. Anybody you are coming with gets the same resident permit that's you coming with. So what happens when you finish school? So, yeah. So the resident permit has said that it gives you the number of years you're coming to study. So I'm coming to study a bachelor's degree. A bachelor's degree is usually around four years. So they give you a resident permit of four years. So you don't need to be changing resident permits. You just come with a four years. Now, at first it used to be that you come with just one year and you have to renew. But now you come with a straight resident permit of the number of years you're coming to spend with your educational uh, degree. So if it's a two year program, you come with a two year degree uh, resident permit. If it's four years, you come with a four years resident permit. Right after your studies, then you can just enter into the job market whatever program that you came to do, you enter into the job market to work. And then if, when it comes to the resident permit, after a cumulative number of years, then you are able to change to either get your passport or get a resident. Uh, people who don't want to get a passport would just get a permanent residency, and which is almost equivalent to having a passport, just that you don't have the right to actually vote, which is the only difference most of them. Wow, that's interesting. So when you finish your two-year master's program, you don't necessarily have to, if you want to stay in, there, is a, there are options available for you to stay in. Is that it? Yeah, so Finland is unique in, in one way and in, in so much ways that if you come and do a degree program, if you come and do a master's degree, a bachelor's degree, you are given the opportunity to stay. And we have a we have an extension of the resident permit we call have complete uh, you've completed a bachelor's degree in Finland. You've completed a degree in Finland. Once you've completed a degree in Finland, you can extend your permit, your residence permit to stay. And you can extend your resident permit for two years, even to say that you're looking for a job. I'm searching for a job, so I want to extend my resident permit. Because you've completed a degree, you are given the two years resident permit to search for jobs. And also, if I decide that, okay, after my studies, I want to go back home. You can go back home. Even if you go and stay 10 years or 15 years back home, you can still come back to Finland because you've completed a degree in Finland. With just the fact that you have a degree certificate from Finland, you are automatically allowed to come to Finland anytime you want to come. No. Yes. But with that, you will still need to apply for a resident yes, permit. Yes, you, you, you apply for a resident permit. Now, your basis is that you've completed a degree in Finland. 
So I moved after my studies. If I decided to come to Ghana to come and work, yes, I'll come to Ghana and work for five years. And if I feel like, okay, now I want to move back to Finland, I'll apply for a resident permit on the basis that I've completed a degree in Finland. And then I'll just be allowed to come back in. Interesting. Yeah. In the UK, they have something called a um, postgraduate visa, which also mm -hmm. allows you um, a two-year period to settle in. But when that two-year program, when that two-year period is over and you don't have a sponsor, it means you're going back to your home country. Yeah. So, so does it mean that over there in Finland, you don't necessarily need a sponsor? Like you okay. don't need someone yeah. to sponsor a visa for you to stay in? No, no. In Finland, you don't need a sponsor to stay here. Apparently, you just need to what Finland wants to have is that if you are staying in Finland, you should be sufficient, uh, self-sufficient enough to take care of yourself. So it encourages people to look for a job. So the system is saying that even if I've, I've completed school and I don't have a job, I'll just apply to the municipality. They call something the TE office. The TE office is the TE unemployment office. So their responsibility is to make sure that people who are unemployed get work, get employed. So whatever means that they will need to improve your standard for you to be able to get an employment, they are in charge of that. So if it's about improving your language skills, if it's about improving your knowledge skills, if you, if you actually want to even change your profession, if you want to change into a different uh, area of expertise, they are the ones responsible for that. So they will guide you as to what to go and what degree you need to have and all that you need to do to be able to get a job. So within that two year span, you have all the necessary help from the government to make sure that you get you get settled with a, a, a well-being job, which would make you be able to stay in Finland. So it's almost like, until you don't want to stay, that is the only option that you would want to leave. But there is no, there is no, there is no clause which needs you, which would say that okay, you don't have a sponsor. Yeah, we don't need you don't need a sponsor actually to stay in Finland because right after completing school, you are allowed to go and search for a job. And there is no limit as to what job you can do. You can do any job, and any job can be used for renewing your permit. So if I decide to okay, I want to be uh, a cleaner, if I get a, a job as a cleaner, would mind uh, what do you call it? work certificates, I could just apply it. I just send it to my MIGRI. That's MIGRI is in charge of our, our permit renewal. You just send it to MIGRI that, okay, I've been employed in this company as a cleaner. And then with that employment certificates, your, your permit is renewed. So you just don't need to, you don't need to have a job in the program that you studied. In some countries, when you study maybe IT, you need to find a job in IT itself. If you study a, a course maybe in business administration, you need to find a job in business administration. You can't find a job in a different uh, area of employment. I think in Germany has that. Most most European countries have that. But in Finland, they don't matter. It doesn't matter. Whatever job, once you are getting paid a minimum wage, that is most important to them. Now let us go back to um the topic of becoming a student, anybody that, if anybody has the interest of schooling in Finland, um, what are the requirements? Because for some universities in the UK, you need to have, um, you need to prove your English language proficiency by, you know, presenting a good score in IELTS tests and all that. So there has to be like that English language thing. So with Finland, is there anything like having to pass your language test? Is there any requirement of that sort? And obviously, you need to submit your certificate. You need to upload your documents like that. But what about the language thing? Okay, okay, good. So depending on the, should I say, depending on the, the level of education you want to apply to. So if I'm applying for a postgraduate program, Okay, let's start with it from the top. If I'm applying for a PhD program, with a PhD okay. program, uh, we have PhD courses most definitely in English language. So in Finland, we have 
we have the main language, which is the Finnish language. And we have auxiliary languages, which is like the Swedish language. So in Finland, we have two recognized national language, which is Finnish and Swedish. So if you're able to speak Finnish or Swedish, these are two recognized national languages. But we also have English as a third secondary language. So you could have English language as a basis for you to get admission. So in you have an English language, there are some specific courses and specific programs you can apply to. For PhD, as international students, you can apply for a PhD program, which is in English. And then with that, you don't need to provide any proficiency because the level of education that you already have attained, that is from bachelor's to master's, it's, and those programs are in English, we assume that your English level is enough for you to be able to accomplish a PhD level. So you don't need an English proficiency. And for PhD applications, most often they are announced on their school's website. So maybe there's a research group which is performing this particular research and then you're interested in it, then you apply to the research group that, okay, I want to be part of this research. And that's the second one. One option that most people don't use is a PhD option. If you have a master's in Ghana, I would advise, just go to any of the universities in Finland, check the programs. Perhaps, okay, you want to do something under public health. Find the schools which have public health. Find the lecturers. Always all the university websites have uh, the tutors, their, their names and their, their whatever they are doing. Look at the area that lecturer is actually assumed to be working under and then write a proposal towards that direction and just send it to the person. And any professor in Finland, when you send the person a mail, the person will respond to you, give you, even if you want to ask advice as to how do you be able to get that post, he'll give you all the advice. And if you follow the advice, you actually will get a post. That is most often how they actually are. They are very down to earth. Yeah. They are very friendly in that regard and ready to help people in that regard. Once they agree that they want to work with you, mm-hmm. You just put in an application for a PhD. That one, you don't need any, you don't usually go through so much processing in a PhD of offer. Once the professor has agreed, you just apply for to the uh, migrate that, okay, you've, given a, you've been given a, po- a position to come and do a PhD with this. You just show uh, maybe your proof of funds that you, you can be able to sustain yourself whilst in Finland, and then that is all, you just come to Finland. There is no, and all year round, all universities take PhD options, positions. So that one, there's no specific time for application. There is always all that all, all year round. You can just apply. Your, once your professor accepts that you want to do a PhD with you, that is all. Let's come back to the next one, which is master's. Master's usually comes with, uh, that is a two-year program. And we have a portal that actually we all apply. And when I come into Finland, for masters, bachelors, and sometimes uh, some of the diploma courses are all applied from one platform. We call it a study info. So from the study info, you're able to apply to every program that you want to do. So mm-hmm. with the program okay. that you're applying to, with the program that you're applying to, if it's a master's program, then you would need to prove your English proficiency because you're coming, to, you're coming to do the program in English. So usually master's program that are for international students are on English basis. So it's not like Finnish. So it's an English program. So they need to know mm-hmm. that actually your English level is enough. Hence, you need to show an IELTS score. Okay. Uh, so that one is requested for everybody who is coming to perform, who is coming to do an, an, a master's program. If you are coming for a bachelor's program, for a bachelor's program, you don't actually need to show, you don't need to show an IELTS level. Most of them would not request for IELTS level, but there is an entrance exams. So the entrance exams test your English skills. And then there is usually an interview that also you need to interact in English language. They are just trying to figure out how your spoken language is how your written language is, that is basically most often 
what the bachelor's program will request you to do. That is the entrance exams. And if you're able to pass the entrance exams very well, and that is a good goal for you, then that means you get admission. Uh, for the diploma, that is for diploma or vocational courses, those ones, they usually will not request for English proficiency or language proficiency, uh, specifically IELTS, but they request for what we call Duolingo English test. So Duolingo English test is almost like the Duolingo we used to be used on our phones, but they also have an English test also. So when you just search Duolingo English test, you see it is just, it is an online test which you do. You don't need to go to any setting like IELTS which you need to go. You just sit down in your home and just do the test. It's around, I think, a two hour test or so. And then when you are done, you get your results, then I think in three days later, and then you can use that to apply for any diploma course that you need to do in general. What is, what is it called? You said Duolingo. Duolingo English test, yes. Or if you want to apply for a, a diploma course from any of the vocational institutions, then usually they request for a Duolingo English test, not an IELTS. So that one is less, it's less complex than the IELTS. Yeah. yeah, you could tell. Are there any scholarship opportunities that, you know, um, the government is offering to for foreign students? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, there's, there is always different forms of scholarships in Finland. In Finland, uh, before, I think, last two years, it used to be that there was no fund, stipend fund. But after last two years, they started presenting stipend funds. Okay. There used to be only tuition waivers where maybe you get a scholarship of a tuition waiver. So if my school fees were like, I'm using me, uh, my situation, for example, my okay. school fees was uh, 10,000 euros and I had a scholarship uh, tuition waiver, only tuition waiver, a scholarship tuition waiver of 70%. So that yeah. means that my tuition was waived off 77,000 euros and then now my tuition was 3,000 euros. So that 3,000 euros is for the year. So within the year, in Finland, you don't need to pay the whole full year before you come to school, no. You pay only half of it, that is for the semester that you're coming. To get your, for you to, to get your permit and everything, you need to pay in just half. And even with that, there is something we call the early bed. So my, my half was 1,500 euros. And then there is an early bed. Early bed is that, okay, when you are given the admission, you have about uh, at the end of the month, sometimes when they give you admission in April, in March, the letter in March, maybe they'll tell you by the end of March or somewhere by the end of April, you are supposed to have paid your school fees. So if you are paying it based on the early bed, you sometimes get another waiver, sometimes mm. 500 euros waiver. So I had, on, I had I paid an early bed and I had 500 euros a waiver. You have to take advantage of this, guys. This is yeah. a cool chop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you get another waiver to for, for that. So wow. That also... So what it means is that for a whole year you are paying three thousand. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then the next year, yeah, is it three thousand. So whatever, whatever, uh, whatever tuition waiver you get runs out to the end of your, your study. So if you have 70% or 50%, that's the same thing. You're going to pay throughout the whole rest of your semesters that you have, yes. So that is that is on the tuition waivers, but they are also, now they are streamlining the scholarship in different ways. So mm -hmm. during my time, it was that you are supposed to complete, uh, so in a whole year, in the whole term of your program, you're supposed to do 120, uh, we call it uh, credit score. Let me put it as credit score, okay? So 120 credit score. After the first year, you're supposed to have done 60 credit score. And then okay. the, the scholarship is on the basis that you were able to complete at least 52 credit score. So if you're able to complete about 52 credit score, that means you qualify for the next year's uh, scholarship tuition waiver. So there is always a clause which will tell you that you have to study. So people come and then they always focus on the work so they don't study much. 
so that they put that clause there to help you to focus also on your studies and not so it means that apart from apart from the 70 percent of what you're left to be what you're left to be paying you you again get another percentage of if you study hard that is on uh no for the 70 percent to be able to be effective the next year which you have a next academic year you should have okay. been able to accumulate that number of credit scores to be able to have okay. it next year. yes okay. that is on our, during my time so and this this percentage actually differs from each program and each school it differs and how the scholarship yeah. goes also differs from each program and each school in some schools what they've mm -hmm. also implemented is that, especially those who are doing the bachelor's degree, the master's degree usually mm -hmm. does, don't have much of, should I say, changes. But those who are doing the bachelor's degree, there's more of, uh, encouragement for us to do more, especially. There is scholarship for uh, if you, in the first year, if you're able to study the Finnish language very well, you sometimes you get maybe uh, 2,000 or 1,005 euros as tuition waiver. Uh, if after the first year, you're able to complete a number of ECTs at a specific CPG, uh, so maybe uh, you're able to make like, in Finland, we grade our, our C GPA as five. So there's one, two, three, four, five. So if you're able to complete somewhere like around three to three point five, uh, 3.5 upwards, yes, 3.5 upwards, then you're able to get another specific amount of scholarship also that is tuition waiver. So it depends on the university or the, the, the course you're also doing. So each, each course and each university has its own way of doing it. There are some also which will tell you that, okay, there is no tuition waiver. You have to pay the whole sum, which you're actually coming for. So it's all, it's all depending on the program you're coming to do and the school you're going to. That's, that, there is this, that's different also. Okay. There is also this TPEN, which I was actually talking about, uh, for master's program. If you're coming to do a master's program, there is this tuition, there's a full, we call it a, fin, a Finland Scholarship Award. So the Finland mm -hmm. Scholarship Award is that when you are, the, the, the whole pool of everybody who is applying for uh, the program, they select the best application, the best applicant. So the best applicant, mm -hmm. the first best applicant for each uh, department is given the full Finland award. The full Finland award is that you don't pay any tuition fee. It's full 100% tuition waiver. And you also get an additional 5,000 euros as stipend which is for you. So when you just come, you just they, you just create your bank account and then they just put in 5,000. And you don't pay any school fees also. That is if you win that. And uh, since they started last two years, I think I know two Ghanaians, one lady in toxicology that had it. And the second, in the next year, the other, there's one other guy who was in toxicology who had it, my university. Uh, and it's, it's, it's frequent that most Ghanaians actually get that scholarship because of, our high level of, like say, our educational system and application that we do. So it's a good thing that I would say anybody who wants to try that to also apply to, to get that. Okay. Is there any, any limit to the number of hours the students can work while in Finland? Okay. For so instance, in the UK, mm -hmm. students, students are limited to 20 hours of working within a okay. week. Is there anything okay. like that in Finland? Yeah, there is uh, a limit of 30 hours per week to work. But it's not so much of a problem. Actually, if you work more than that, which is less likely that you work more than that. But of course, you could work a full-time job. If you're working more than 30 hours, that means you're almost working a full-time job. It's like 35 hours per week. So if you're working a full-time job, even let's say you're working a full-time job, that means you earn more than what you expected to earn. Okay, so you just need to, you would have to increase your taxes. So they've made it 35 so that, uh, 30, sorry, it, they've made it 30 so that you don't need to pay more taxes. So that is the main basis for them telling us to work up to 30. Because if you work more than 30, 
that means your taxes has to be increased and then you need to pay more taxes. But if you are working somewhere like 30, then you don't need to pay so much taxes. About You get about 0.5% as your tax rate. But if you are working somewhere like 35 hours to 40 hours, you'll be paying somewhere around maybe 12% uh, of your income to be as your taxes. So that's the difference. So that is why they actually encourage us to do 30 hours. Not necessarily if you work more than 30 hours, there's going to be a problem. That wouldn't be a problem. You just need to pay more taxes. That is the only difference. Yeah. And even if you are working more, you don't need it wouldn't affect you in any way because when you're coming to school, like I'm coming for a, a master's program, I'm giving two years of resident permit. So if I work more and then later I'm renewing my permit, I wouldn't be renewing my permit permit as a student again. I'll be renewing my permit as a graduate. Hence my hours that I've worked wouldn't affect my decision in me renewing my permit. At first, it used to be a problem, but now it doesn't, it's not actually a, a problem, even if you work more than the 30 hours that they've given to you as a student. Yeah. So there is no so much restricted limit, but you can work more or you can work less. Yeah. But guys, I always believe in playing fair. Please, when you go, Stick to your 30 hour limit. Yeah. Do not overwork yourself. Don't yeah. kill yourself. Oh. Yes, it's, it's very important. It's very important. Anyway, so let's say a person is working 30 hours a week. How much on the average is a person likely to make? I understand the wages will be different, the rates will be yeah. different. Yeah. But on the average, how much are we looking at for a student per week? Yeah, so the minimum wage currently is, uh, I think, 11.8, 11.8 euros. So somewhere uh, will be, maybe I'll see this calculator, but it should be, you'll be earning somewhere like a thousand, a thousand two in that regard. If you are working about 30 hours per week, yeah, so we are earning around thousand, thousand two in that regard. So yeah, thousand to thousand five, depending on how much you work. But if you're working actually a, a 30, 30 hours full time a week, then you'll be earning around somewhere like a thousand two euros. Yeah. Thousand two. So, so averagely taxes, in a month. Come in after, tax, after taxes, maybe uh, you would earn somewhere like around a uh, thousand or thousand one in that regards. Oh, that's good. That's mm -hmm. good. Yeah. So in a month, we are looking at um, how much? Four thousand eight to five thousand, um, what euros? Uh no. So I'm talking about in the month. So if it's thirty hours, or my calculation is maybe. So if it's thirty hours, perhaps in a week, right? Thirty hours in a week. You have uh, how many days? Um. Uh, Eight days. So usually, when you work on the weekend, you are you, you are given a double pay. Or if you work on a Sunday, Sundays are double pay. But if you work on a normal day, which is Monday to Saturday, it's the normal uh, payment that you get. So even if it's 11, 11 euros, eleven euros per hour. Uh, let's say eleven point eight times. 30, 30 hours, you are getting somewhere around 354 in one month, in one week. So within the whole month, you are getting somewhere like a thousand four. So okay. one thousand four, and then you that will be tax deduction. So even tax deduction will be somewhere like two hundred euros. You'll be coming home with around one thousand two in a month. One thousand in a month. That makes yeah. sense. If if a student is going to be earning thousand one or even thousand a week, yeah, my God. That is, that is <laughs> that is okay. yes. then it means that we we all would have to come there. Yes, yes, of course, <laughs> of course. That would be outrageous. That's a lot, a lot of money. Yeah, so thousand one thousand. I mean thousand two there. That's not too bad for mm -hmm. a student. That's not too bad. But how much uh, roughly is accommodation? How much is a student expected yeah, to Yeah, so paid? student accommodation. So in Finland, every every town has accommodation for students. 
So in my town, which is Kofi, we have a Kofi, uh, we call it Kofas. Uh, so the accommodation is ranges within uh, 250 to 350, depending on what you want. So if you want somewhere like uh, a self, uh, one room with your own bathroom, your kitchen, all that, you'd be paying somewhere around 350 on a year studio. Per month. Per month. Yes, if you want a studio where you have your own room, your own kitchen, your own everything, then you'd be paying somewhere around 350. But if you want uh, somewhere with a shared apartment with other people, then you, you can come down as low as 250 euros per month. Yes. And how much is a student expecting to be spending on food? I mean, living expenses. So living from accommodation. It, it, it's, it's, it's always subjective in that regards because it depends yeah. on who you are. But on average, I'll say that somewhere you'll be spending around 100 to 200 euros, depending on how much you want to eat. Because if you're a student and you decide to have most of your lunch from campus, a campus lunch, which is usually a buffet, so usually all campus or university or any college uh, lunch is usually a buffet. So usually you have different options. You have vegetarian meals, you have the normal meals with meat, you have the salad options, the food options and the drinks and milk and all those things and bread options. And then you're allowed to eat whatever, take a plate of whatever you want to take. And then it costs somewhere like, uh, at most it depends on the meat or the, if they make a special meal a special meal for students who pay who pay somewhere like three euros, three euros fifty cents. But a normal meal is without like special meal, like they making special meal, then you'll be paying somewhere around two euros ten cents or one euros fifty cents for a lunch. Yeah. So and and that we, is a buffet. Yeah, a buffet lunch. Yeah, a buffet lunch. So you get to choose for the, pick as much as you want, and then you pay somewhere like. That is at most at, at in my, what I've, I've I've had, they had they made this one special chicken brawlies with uh and hamburgers. I think hamburgers, they've done hamburgers, they done some chicken brawlies there and taco. So when they make special meals, that is when the price goes up. But apart from that, the normal price, which is like rice, potatoes. Those all the normal food, which is normal without any special thing, is usually will be costed somewhere around 250 or one, 150 euros. 1.5, 1 euro 50 cents or two euros. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Not wow. only the meal, like a, there's a hamburger or there's something that is a special meal that they are making for that day, usually it doesn't That's... go as much as three euros. That's very, very, very economical. Yeah. Very, if very you economical. To, if, if you actually are schooling in a, a vocational institution, like uh, if you're coming to do, if you're doing a diploma in a vocational institution, feeding is free. You get to eat free. There's no tuition. It's just, you, know, just, you just come <laughs> and enjoy. So the only thing you pay is your, your accommodation. Yeah. So you eat lunch for free. There's no tuition. You just pay your accommodation and then you live your life. So depending on where, 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 wherever you find yourself, there's there's different options that you get. So is there anything that you you wish you knew earlier before going to Finland as a student? Is there anything that you wish you knew earlier? So as a student, uh, when I was coming, actually, I made more research with how the whole place is, the temp the living condition and how work actually uh, is as in how to find work and all those. So when I was coming, I was a little bit prepared. But one thing that I didn't know, especially as I just said about the vocational institution, I never knew there was something like that, that there was an opportunity for you to apply to a vocational institution and then you didn't pay school fees, you didn't pay for, so <laughs> there is free lunch and all that. I didn't know about that. So if I had known that, I would have gone for that so I would have been with it. But all the same, I had a program I wanted to come and do, and that was it. So that was I needed to pay tuition. So you getting more informed is one of them that I think is very important. To get more informed about the things that are 
happening in Finland, how to actually navigate your way around it is very important. The other aspect is that uh, I wish I'd, I'd be more attentive as to learning the Finnish language earlier, because now I'm done with school, I have to uh, leave some time to be actually learn the Finnish language. Guys, while this has been a very informative um, um, session, I've learned a lot, I believe you have. Now, we'll end today's video here, and then I'll see you in the next video where we will talk about how to go through the application process itself. So I'll see you guys in my next video. Consider subscribing and like this video. Bye.